Thank you for all turning up and for finding the place. We've been moved out of our usual venue just uh, for this week because there is a governing authority meeting. Um, I'd like you, you all here to, to give a big welcome to one of the country's most uh, experienced national news editors and managers, Michael Brophy. Michael is the former editor of the Irish Independent, the Evening Herald, and uh, was the relaunch editor of the Irish Star. Uh, he went on then to become the managing director of independent group Sunday Newspapers, where he developed Sunday World into the country's uh, best-selling uh, Sunday newspaper. Following this, he became the chief executive of the Irish-based Independent News and Media, leading the company's publishing, digital and printing operations across Northern Ireland. He's currently the chairman of the Sunday World and chairs the National Newspapers of Ireland Journalism Awards Committee. Now for any of you um, who want to know what that is, that is the committee that gives out um, the top awards to uh, working journalists in Ireland, in Ireland. Every journalist in the country wants to win one. Um, you remember a couple of weeks ago we had Kitty Holland here from the Irish Times. She won the, uh, the National Newspaper of Ireland Journalist of the Year Award last year for her story on the Savita Halapanaver uh, case in Galway. Um, so again, uh, these awards are given out every year. Um, in recent years, Michael has become a media consultant and he's the chairman of the Hume Brophy PR and Public Affairs Agency. Uh, this was founded by Michael's son, Owen, and John Hume's son, who was also called John, in 2005. They now have 60 consultants working across financial, consumer, energy, security, and tra transport sectors. He's going to talk to you today about how to successfully pitch a story to a news editor. The common mistakes that many young journalists make starting off, and maybe his own experience of you know, editing the big stories. So I'd like you to give him a warm welcome. Thank you. Just uh, when we mentioned that, uh, it's, it's a great privilege for me to be here today, and uh, um, I hope that um, when we finish that, uh, we all have learned something about it. You know. What I want to concentrate on today is um, I've been at a whole lot of seminars, a whole lot of debates, and you all have talked about it, and you've all heard about it. I don't want to talk about newspapers. I don't want to talk about the web. I don't want to talk about Twitter, Facebook, or any other platform. What I want to talk today about is about journalism, which is what you're studying. And I think journalism can be confused too readily with newspapers, Twitter, what's happening in journalism. In my view, very little is happening in journalism. In my view, journalism is becoming more and more available to a more global and wider audience. And that's what you're studying, and that's what you, is, is the future in journalism. The fact that it's on, it's on the screen, the fact that it's on phones, that should not make it fundamentally different to what journalists do. Um, and just to uh, help out, um, we mentioned um, the National Journalism Awards. I'm very fortunate enough to be on the committee um, that examines those awards. And it started, those awards started three, three, four years ago. And if you want to think anything about your futures, which you obviously do, and the future of the business that you've chosen, that, those awards started and we had something like 250 individual entries, that's from individual journalists. Um, in the first year we had 500 in the second year, and last year we had 650 entries. And it's not an exaggeration to say it, that the quality of the, I, I read I think about 2,000 <coughs> articles for that, as did as all the judges. And it's not an exaggeration to say that the quality of the copy was absolutely superb. I mean, every single thing um, was, was, every piece was fantastic. And it came down at the end to two people, um, one of whom I know very well and one of whom I didn't know. It was, um, and I'm not telling tales out of school, it was Paul Williams uh, who did the Anglo Tates, which everybody remembers. And that was a classic example of uh, interaction between um, the written word the Irish Independent that morning 
and then you go to the website a couple of hours later and you actually hear the tapes. And it was a wonderful story, it was a great coup, it was, it was really, really good. And then it came in between, it was between that and between um, Kitty Holland, uh, who wrote the story about the girl in Galway who died um, in, after uh, difficulties. And the third one was um, uh, Walsh uh, in the Sunday Times, who, who did the articles about Lance Armstrong. David Walsh. Uh, David Walsh. Yeah. Um, and he, he finally exposed Lance to Arms, Armstrong. So, I mean, if we, if, if we think about Irish journalism and where it is and what place it holds in the community and how it can still change the community in which it operates, just take those three articles. You know, take the Anglo tapes. You know, it, it, it shot the country. It showed what the bankers were up to. It got behind the, 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 the surface. And it was straight reporting of a story. Here's what happened on the phones when two bankers got together. Take the second, take the Dave Dewan story, which was Lance Armstrong, one of the world's greatest icons, seven times winner of the Tour de France, had repelled every single television, radio, French newspaper um, article. Lequipe tried to expose him, what, four years ago and failed. He sued Lequipe. He sued the Sunday Times, got a million pounds from the Sunday Times, and he was forced to give it back with interest of a half a million to the Sunday Times. I mean, think, think of how that changed the entire world of international sport, not only cycling, but international sport. <coughs> and then move on to the Kitty Holland story, which was an incredible expose of, of, of um, what happened in a hospital the night um, she went in to get help from a hospital. And as it turned out, she died with her husband by her side and her husband blaming the hospital from the very start. That story ran and ran and ran and that story managed to change the law the law was changed very very quickly so after about 20 years there was uh, there was uh, <coughs> uh, there was uh, legislation in front of the bureaucracy which was never ever enacted and it took that <coughs> excuse me it took that story to change the law so here we were last november faced with these three incredible stories and one vote separated with and I actually think the reason um, I don't vote on that committee, uh, I just chair it, but I, I, I think the reason that Kitty Holland won it was because she had managed to change the law. She had managed to do something that nobody else had done. And it would have been very easy for her, well, I don't know where she got the story, whether she got it from the hospital, whether she got it from the husband. I don't think she did get it from the husband. But she threads through that story with great, great diligence, trying not to get anything wrong, trying not to be opinionated, trying not to put her own opinion into the story. She worked that story until it came out the other end, then got great trust from the husband. Uh, he started talking to her, he started confiding in her. He, uh, she won his trust, and we had what, what, what we had out of that. We, we saw what happened in the end. So um, that is. Th those three stories are an example of what I'd like to highlight today. Um, the, the, the fundamental in the three stories is journalism. The fundamental is um, what I put down today uh, for, 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 for ideas that I was going to talk about was what I call the benchmarks of journalism. And I think these benchmarks existed in all these stories because if they didn't the stories wouldn't be right and the benchmarks that i put down were information lance armstrong was taking drugs bankers were talking on the phones about, about illegalities information the, the fundamental is uh, the information is the start uh, i put down accuracy which i regard and i want to get back to that i want to get back to how everything must be so, so accurate. And it, 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 in this world of, of multimedia, um, and I, I'm going to sound very old fashioned here, but in the world of multimedia, because people are communicating by phone, because people are communicating on Twitter, on Facebook, <coughs> these are not, these are platforms 
they are not journalistic platforms until we make them journalistic platforms. If you talk to your friend on Facebook or other communication levels like that, and you tell them a story on that, that's all very well. That's top of the head stuff. That's what happened that whatever, wherever you were last night, what went on, what your opinion is, uh, what your opinion of the match yesterday was, what your opinion of something else was. You, you, you go to a movie <coughs> and you bash out an opinion. You cannot do that in journalism. This, well, what you're doing on Facebook, what you're doing in, com in electronic communication, let's call it, is not journalism. It's communication. So journalism requires a higher level of communication than that. And it's not just something you sit down and bang it out. It's something that you think about. It's something like, what are the priorities in my mind about this story? How do I structure my story? It's a, it's a hard news story. It's a road traffic accident. And they're all the same. There used to be a thing they call who, what, when, where, how. And they still stand. I mean, you're not going to get information out unless you get those right. I put in as a benchmark, no comment. If you're doing a news story, you must not comment. It, it, it is one of the no-nos. And I was telling, I was talking uh, uh, early to Mary about this. Um, and uh, I would ask this to be held in confidence. But there, there's a case, um, in, 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 there's a case being judged at the moment in, in, in press council circles. circles about a court case about a girl who um, I, can't, I don't know actually what she did, what she was accused of but she was in her mid-twenties and um, she obviously had an awful lot of difficulties and she was up before court in this area and um, she came up for, for a decision by the judge and the um, senior counsel who defended her said that my client, Mary Smith <coughs> when she committed these offences was in a very dark place. Now everybody in this room knows what he was saying. The reporter knew what he was saying. And he, uh, the reporter, wrote in the weekly newspaper that the girl was given psychiatric uh, treatment or whatever it was. Uh, the judge, or the, her defence counsel in mitigation pleaded, or said that she was in a very dark place. Uh, uh, comma, uh, she has been known to suffer depression for the last 20 years or so or 15 years or so her brother has now contacted the authorities or the press council and her brother has claimed, has said that this is totally wrong because it was it was not reported in court that this girl suffered from depression and um, if if it was reported in court it's fine and that case is to come before the press council and without prejudging it in my view, the reporter had absolutely no authority or no right to write that. And um, if it could, if it happened, if it happened in any other aspect of a of a story, uh, um, if, if that's expand, expanded across the entire gamut of, of court reporting, you mean don't go to courts because what you do in courts is absolutely stick to the agenda. You can describe how the defendant looks, you can describe how the defendant's acted in court, if he said that thing. But you cannot comment unless you are there to comment. And then it's a different... But you, you probably all heard the comments in the court the other day about the... Um, <coughs> about the, the rapist in Athlone, about the two young children, which was quite horrific. But I thought, was it yesterday morning or the morning before, Derek MacDonald, whom I would recommend that everybody <coughs> listen to, described it on the, on the rich. She wrote a brilliant piece in the Irish Independent, and she, she spoke on the Sean O'Rourke show on the radio. And that's classical court comment, where she talks about the, her feeling, what she felt the feeling in the court. But she didn't say anything about the defendant. She said he looked fine, he looked good, he minked. And that's all he said. He, he, she never ever said, he looks like a rapist. He must be a rapist. She didn't do that. So when you're in court, when you're dealing with court, you must detach yourself you can't say things like the, 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 the defendant said or the defendant's um, lawyer said mysteriously she was in a dark place you must, your, job is, your job is to report and not comment 
Um, another benchmark that I put down when I, when I challenge myself with this about it is <coughs> what I call about it is, is a sense of inquiry. And, and, and it's something I worked in, in as both as a reporter and investigative reporter, the night editor. And I often, and I think sometimes people like yourselves at this stage of your careers should think about it. Yeah, yeah. And I often think about what journalism is when I look at the rate, when I look at the television, when I watch, when I go to a press conference and I watch journalists sit out. To, <laughs> journalists are not just simple communicators. You, you took a decision a couple of years ago to put yourself in, in, a, in a kind of a special place in the society in which we live. And I, I don't think any of you think you're above society or that you're there to exist because you get into <coughs> cinema premieres for nothing or that you end up going to nice dinners or that you end up being able to sit in the doll or the courts or that society treats when, when you go out and start pursuing your career society will treat you a little differently than it does the ordinary person like if, if there's if there's a, a disaster and you're working for the Irish Independent or whoever you're working for, and you arrive at that and you say, well, I'm from the Chicago sometimes, you will be treated differently because society regards you as <coughs> different from them. That you're like the firefighter, you're like the, you're a specially identifiable group of people. And now the next question is, what do you do? Like, you don't just go along and watch fires. You go along and you report on the fire. And then the next thing you ask is, well, how did it start? And you're trained to ask these questions. And then the next thing, you're told that the mother and her baby jumped from the top floor. And you say, well, how did they get up there? And why was the stairs not available. And then you will find out at, on the third day you're on the story but there's been a terrible tragedy that perhaps the fire door was locked. And you say, well, why was the fire door locked? Isn't the fire door supposed to be open at all times? And and if you develop this sense of inquiry, without it being a arrogant sense of inquiry, without saying I'm entitled to these to these answers. If you just innocently develop a sense of inquiry that quietly asks the questions that you feel needs answering, that's what starts it. That's what separates you from society, and that's what allows you to sit down in front <coughs> of Enda Kenny and the John Burtons of this world and the Amy Gilmore and their communications officers, who are exceptionally skilled in getting you to write what they want you to write. And you're able to start that inquiry. And he says, well, I've announced 500 jobs. We have 500 new jobs for him next week. You say, well, I thought you announced that last week. Or that was announced the week before. So it's a sense of inquiry. And it's not a sense that you don't take everything at face value. Because there are some things you take at face value, like if it looks like a duck, it is a duck. You say, well, that's fine. But it's on the important issues to, to, to step back and to, 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 like when you're reading background articles, when you're reading background stuff, when you're looking at somebody's biography, like you say that, you, uh, you, 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 you to, for, for Mary, remind me of there, like that you see from 1995 to 2000, he was, um, he was a, I don't know, a politician. And then from the year 2006 to the year 2010, he was the European Commissioner. And then what you do is you look at that and you say, well, this doesn't tell me the full story because it doesn't tell me what he did between 2000 and 2006. Now, I think that's worth asking the question. And what has happened an awful lot, because information is so readily available, is that if somebody puts down a biography on the on on, on uh, Google or on LinkedIn or whatever it is, people go into that and they pick it up 
and they say, oh, that'll do me, bang, and they bang it in. So that, it's the sense of inquiry, it's a sense of, it's a sense of, it's not a sense of, of mistrust or anything like that, it's just a sense to, to ask the question that somebody who is not a journalist wouldn't ask, or would be afraid to ask. And, and, and funny, I was reading last night, uh, I always had an interest in the great spy scandal of the, of the 70s, uh, the Kim Philby, Guy Burgess, McLean, many of you might know this, some of you, but it was the biggest, biggest spy scandal, spy scandal in, the, in, the, in the world ever. And that was broken by a newspaper called the Sunday People in London. Now, the Sunday People we know it now as a sex and drugs and rock and roll page. But the Sunday people broke that pay, broke, broke, broke that. And the reason they did was because um, the gay community in London and Cambridge was very tightly and ill-reported upon. And to be gay in the early 60s was to be a target of the, of the media. And they actually, the Sunday people followed Burgess McLean and Guy Burgess McLean and I don't know who the first was. Um, and they tracked them into this gay community. They called it a nest of vipers in Cambridge College, and they tracked them back. And that's the way they went on. But on the way, they discovered the spy ring. And suddenly, the spy ring took over. And it's, it, 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 it was the biggest uh, spy, spy ring in, in, in British history. Um, as a benchmark of journalism, I also put down, and I hope I'm able to explain this correctly. Uh, and I think if you adopt the, the foregoing, like the information, accuracy, good communication, no comment, sense of inquiry, not going through the motions. I mean, it really, really, if, if, if you're dealing with news editors, if you're dealing with editors, no, you're better off go to the movies, go to the pub, go to the cafe, then write something you don't want to write, or then write something badly. Like if, if, if somebody gives you a job at five o'clock in the evening about, um, I don't know, uh, anything, and say, oh God, I, I, I have to, um, I have to, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm off at six o'clock and my neighbour ages to do this, and my neighbour ages to do this, and there's a girl missing with her baby, and I just ring the guards and I go onto the web and I see the girl is missing, and I contact the local guardian, I said, this girl, I said, yeah, yeah, what age is she? she said, well, I, we don't know. Okay, what age is the child? We think the child is a year. And you and you write an article which says, because you're going out to the movies or because you're over the pub, you write an article which said a, a mother um, was missing last night with her six-month-old baby and nobody knows where she is and guardian at Liberty Garden Station have all the details and requests. What you're leaving behind there, you've gone through the motions and you're off at six o'clock and that's it. What you're leaving behind there is a whole series of unanswered questions. A massive series. You don't know who the mother is, you don't know who the child is, you don't know if the mother's single, you don't know if the mother is married, you don't know if there's other children in the family, you don't know if the mother living at home, you don't know how the mother being treated for drugs. And if you get that story at five o'clock, you might as well have faced it. It's going to take you anything from one to five hours to six hours to do that story correctly. And that's what you have to buy into. You know, like, if you don't want to do that, if you don't want to hurt your mind inquiring, you know, work at the civil service is easier. You know, you get home at five o'clock. I, I uh, remember a story where, um, the girl was given us, I, I was editing the star one night, on a Friday night, I'll always remember this, and um, it got to about nine o'clock and we were kind of having a look at everything that was done. And we said, well, everything is fine, we're going, we're going for nine o'clock. And um, we were clearing out the baskets, news baskets, shorts baskets, and uh, we were making sure we had everything in the paper that needed to be in the paper. And, and a girl, uh, I love I love to remember actually leaving the office that night at six o'clock or half six. And um, this was about nine o'clock. And she had written a, a paragraph that I came across. 
and it was one paragraph, and it says, it says something like, ESB technicians, um, ESB technicians are to go ahead with their uh, planned one day strike or planned strike from Monday morning, and this could mean widespread power cuts throughout the city, or throughout Dublin and Limerick and Cork and throughout the country. Uh, a union spokesman could not be contacted for comment last night. I looked at this, and I always remember thinking, like, are we going to have power cuts? Are we not going to have power cuts? If we're going to have power cuts, where are they going to take place? What's going to happen? And this girl wrote this. So I, I uh, she was gone, and I uh, called it that, um, called another report, and I said, look, can we find out what's happening on this? And it took him half an hour to find out. And he came back and he said, there's no threat. We've been out to the union. That was a threat from earlier in the day. And in fact, what this girl had done, or was given, she was giving a cutting from the one of the evening papers in Dublin, told to check it out. She didn't check it out. But can you imagine if we put that story in the table? Like, you'd be sitting there and saying, my God, it's got to be power cuts tomorrow. We've got to get food in, we've got to drink in, we've got to do whatever. And what really annoyed me that, that, that night was, I went down for a pint to the pub at around, I'd say, half nine, quarter to ten. And the girl who left the office at half six was in the pub having her couple of pints. And I really, that really annoyed me because here was I, the editor, and I don't mind doing her work, I don't mind helping her, I don't mind leading her, guiding her. But she said, well, look, that, uh, I just throw that into the, uh, into the thing, I've gone through the motions. And I go to the pub. She never, ever worked for the Sarah again. And she, she actually doesn't know why. But if she had done that, and if she had came to the desk and said, I can't find this out, I don't know, I don't know what's happening. The unions won't talk to me, the company won't talk to me. Like, suddenly people stick around, and they're like, well, all just you, we all just occupy different places on the ladder in, in journalism. And, and we just said, well, okay, so we can't find it out, so let's tell the public we can't find out what's going on with the virus. So not going through the motion, or going through the motion, it's really better off not doing it. You know, it's, it's just better off not doing it. Um, <laughs> When talking about going through the motions, not going through the motions, uh, when, I, when I was editing the Herald, uh, I, there was a, it was in very the olden days of hard copy stuff and things like that. But there was a quite a, a not that elderly, but he was uh, he had seen a lot of life, and uh, um, I used to give him stories to very small stories to fill in his day, as it were. And uh, I noticed after. It took me a long time to notice that they never turned up in the production room. Like, you give them small stories and they never turned up. Uh, and uh, I went out to the loo's one day, and in the loo, I found one of the stories in the waste paper basket. So it was a small story. And uh, I came back and I said to the production editor, I said, oh, that story is in the. How did I get into the loo? He said, Oh, I said, that's James. He says, He just can't handle handling stories. He just can't. So what he does is when somebody gives him a story, he goes to the loo, he throws it away. And it's forgotten. Which, is, which I just thought was that's not that's actually not not going through the roads. Um, the other word I put down and, and I thought of it the other night, um, I, I I come late to uh, House of Cards, the, the new version of it. And and um, I suppose everybody here has seen it before me in their own third series. But I was looking at and I was looking at the first encounter between the reporter and the politician. And she said, um, I put everything in the paper that you want me to put in the paper, which I thought was a very good deal. Now, she, she knew that she was going to compromise herself along the way somewhere, and she probably gets compromised somewhere later in the series. And she said, um, either one of them said to the other, you know, we must trust each other. It's not, it's not an essential benchmark of writing a blog, it's not an essential benchmark of, of, of communicating across Facebook or communicating across other platforms. But it is in a, if you are going to work in, in a, at a high level of journalism, um, and you're all, being, you're all going to be well trained to do so, um, trust 
is one of the serious things that you have to do that. And you have to, news editors have to trust you, editors have to trust you, the people you meet have to trust you. And you will come across a huge amount of people. You'll come across bereaved parents, you'll come across people in difficulties, you'll come across people walking out of court who know they're going to get a 20 year sentence. You'll come across politicians whom you know want to use you as a mouthpiece. And you have to, you have to give them a, a, a sense that you are trustworthy. That you will not compromise them. It's, it's an interesting, I mean we can talk about it later. It's an interesting payoff and if, if, when I watch this scene, what's better? Is it better to get a good lead from a politician knowing that he's going to screw you in six months time to get something in about him or something in about it's a, it's a hard question to answer but, but I think that trust will cover a lot of that you know that, 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 that he knows the extent of how that he or she knows the extent of how that trust will, 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 will work and you know how it's going to work and in fact Oh, yeah. I think it's one of the great difficulties of journalism today, and it has nothing got to do with modern platforms, but one of the great difficulties of journalism today is that, and if you watch how it works, and you can, let's just talk about politics, or let's, let's talk about politics, it's the, easy, it's the easiest. If you watch politics and operation in Dublin today, there are anywhere today, but particularly we say in our environment, that in Leicester House, it is handled totally by communications officers. Totally by communications officers. Um, you hear, you see journalists talking to ministers in their cars as they as they come out of the out of the um, door. I personally don't feel that that's an adequate representation of the, of the body politic. I think that when I started talking to you about the the place that journalists hold or have put themselves in society. I think you're letting the side down if you ring up Rory Quinn's secretary or the communicator, the comms expert, and if you say, uh, you know, what's the minister doing today? What's he doing that like? Oh, he believes very strongly that we should have new schools. And that you put down on your paper, the minister believes very strongly that Rory Quinn needs new schools. You don't know that. You've been told by a communications officer who gets paid 90 grand a year to uh, keep you out for his or her hair. So I'm not saying all the time to try to go past that. But sometimes, if you're in the doll, that you go up to Rory Quinn and you say to him, oh, I believe you want schools and, uh, and try to get past this barrier. Like, it's not like going, you, the, you, in, a, in a supermarket, there's a whole range of goods behind the checkout and your communication is with the checkout there, that's okay. But it's not okay in the profession which you undertake, but you, you decide to go into. Because you must, the, 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 the comms officer, the, the, the PR person for the University of Limerick, the PR person for Plessis, the PR person for, they have a job to do. They have a job which goes back to my benchmarks. They have a job to nullify your sense of inquiry. They have a, a job to control the information that's going to you. They have a job to utilize your good communications techniques for their own benefit. They have a job to channel you into what they want released. And, and this is, I, I think this is happening far too, far too much in Germany. <coughs> I, I, hear, I hear people ringing um, press officers and they say, well, the information is all on the website. No, the information is not all on the website. Not all the information is on the website. The, the information on the website is what you put on the website and it's what you want us to take. Your inquiry mind has to get behind that. And for instance, if you met the chief executive of that company walking out of the office that night, and he said to you, if he said to you, you say, well, look, I was just looking at the annual report, and 
I don't, I, I don't think that second line figures is very good. And he said, well, yeah, we did this, we did that. And if you put that in the paper the next morning, or in the, on, your, uh, on your website, I would guarantee you that the first person who would bring you would not be the chief executive. It would be the communications officer. Because her day has been screwed up by you. And nothing has gone according to plan. Because I, I have a small link with the other side. And I see how it works. They're very happy when they get into the paper what they want you to do. But you must not, and I really, really mean this, you must not be happy with that. I, I then thought about, um, and we've spoken about news. I, I will briefly speak about uh, comment in newspapers. As I said, I would recommend everybody read their uh, McDonald's piece in the Irish Independent. You pick it up on the night. Um, last, I think it was last Tuesday, whichever day uh, your man was sent is for the child rate the day after. But it was really, really good. But I then said, to, there are two elements in a newspaper, really, as we all know. There's, there's the comment and there's the, 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 the news. We've, we, we discussed the idea of mixing um, comment and news, and we said, in a perfect world, it's a no. You just can't. I mean, don't even think of it, you know, uh, like the guy in court, like, well, he, he did look like a killer, you know, like, how do you know what the killer looks like, you know, so uh, just don't think of comment in it as part of a new story, it's uh, a new story. In, in comment, and it's very important because the multi-platform, uh, the emergence of the multi-platform uh, phenomenon has really made comment very, very, it's readily available. I mean, if you, if you pick up, if you read a story on any website and you look at the comment on the read, so I, I certainly think that an awful lot of it is in name, it's not worth its place, it's not considered, and, and, and it really is letting the word comment down. I mean, it's an opinion, nobody minds opinion, but what I've got to try to do now is to bring you through what comment should be. Because comment should, should help me learn about uh, about things I don't know about. I, I've been, um, to, to my shame, I'm not very well informed on the U. I know it as much as most people do about the Ukraine, Russia, Crimea, but over the last couple of days I've been reading intensely on this and, and it really is good stuff. And it's not East versus West, it's not Putin versus Kerry, it's not Obama in a new Cold War. It's not a new Cold War. And this has come into the media. I mean, it's a new hot war. It, it's, but the comment has been really, really good. And it's brought me to places which I, I, I had not been before. I, I look upon comment and, and, and I look at the benchmarks of good comment. The first thing I look for is accuracy. Again, we're back to this word accuracy. Because I have to know and understand what's on. I also look for authority. Now, authority is not something that comes when you're 55 years of age and you're a professor of history at UCD or Limerick University. You can be authoritative at any stage of your life. I mean, if you were a rugby player and, and you played with, at, at, at inter-provincial level, you say, or played semi-pro, you have an authority to speak about rugby. If, if, if you have been a, a researcher in in the political department of a government, uh, you have an authority, but you mustn't let it down. And you, you, you must understand what that authority is, so that when people read it, they will understand what you're trying to get at. And that comes with, that particularly is relevant to sport. I mean, how many times have we all left the ground or talked the next day in the pub about a match, and we said, did you read Neil Francis in the end you know, somebody would say, well, uh, he wasn't at the same match as I was at. So you must really, you must stand to your authority. It's not opinion, it's authority. You must also have your research. We, I mean, I think that's a given. You must know, you must know what the charges against the guy was. What, you must know the background to it, and that requires reading. That does not require going off to a website, picking up a 
background, cutting and pasting four paragraphs out of it and slapping it into your, into your uh, article. That does not work. It'll, you'll be found out for that. Um, in fact, most news editors, I don't know, are you aware, <coughs> most news uh, organizations now run programs uh, which you uh, on there. Uh, like when you drop a story into my machine, I've dropped that into a program before it goes on to or process it for stuff, plagiarism from the net. And I, they, it'll pick up, if you've dropped, if you've lifted and pasted four paragraphs, it'll pick that up and put a red flag at it. So I know that you, as a news out there, that you lifted that from the net. Um, I, I, I put down research. Relevance. Well, I mean, relevance is, uh, I mean, <laughs> There's no point in writing an article, a comment article about Ukraine, is it, if everybody is happy in Ukraine. So I mean, relevance is the is the um, is, is is very important. Again, I, I put down good communication. You know, people love reading good art. But they're not aware of the problem. I mean, well, one of the garbage of articles I read last week about Ukraine, I was travelling. And I read it on a Blackberry, Blackberry. There was two and a half thousand words in it, but it was engaging, and I didn't, I didn't find that uncomfortable. Uh, so I mean, it, it's the product you're looking at. The method of delivery is not important. Informed opinion. Opinion. And this is in published articles. Informed opinion is terribly, terribly important. That you must be able to conclude at the end of your comment piece. That given everything I've written before, this is what I conclude. Now you may be, well, you shouldn't be totally wrong, but you may be, you, you may disagree with what the, what, what the consensus is. But at least you have informed yourself, and you will give people. I always think it's easy. You give people the, the right to sit at dinner parties, or the right to go to the pub, or the right to sit around the coffee table and say. Uh, pretend that they know all about the Ukraine, but they know nothing about the Ukraine except what they know. And, and, and that's why these things become uh, um, crutches for, 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 for people's searching knowledge. And again, I put down the word trust. And the word trust in this, in common, comes at a different level because it comes as the trust between the writer in this instance and the reader. Because if I read an article about sport, about politics, about Eastern Europe, if I if 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 if, if I if what you've written in the first six paragraphs is absolute rubbish, ill-informed, harangueing, I, I, I can't trust that anymore, and I will go away from it, and I will not read you anymore. Um, so there are the benchmarks that I put down, and and and. I, I'm not going to. I'm, I'm not going to talk now about the web, newspapers. I'm t I was talking all the time about communication and about journalism because it is it, journalism hasn't changed. The methods of delivery of journalism has changed, and, and and what I want to remind ourselves on is that uh, blogs. <laughs> I put out a line here that I'm not sure I understand myself. It says blog, blogs can be journalism, and oft times blogs are not journalism. So if, if, if you take authoritative bloggers, I think blog is an awful word for, 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 for journalism. But if you take some of the American political blogs, if you take Guido Fox in, 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 in London, if you take some of the stuff in Irish politics, is okay. Um, but they are, they're comment. But it's, it's all mixed up. The delivery is all mixed up. So you want to be terribly careful. Like it kind of says, well, John Kerry is failing to handle the, uh, uh, failing to handle the, uh, the, the Ukrainian crisis. Well, well, we'd expect that. What would you expect of a quasi-Republican Democrat who failed to win? And that, that's allowed in the blog, but it's not allowed in comment. I mean, it, it, it has to be a bit more tempered. And, and, and I suppose you're talking about the case, a bit like, yes. like a, you know, in a judge, a ju when a judge is given a judgment, he makes a case as to why he's coming yeah. to his decision. So it's sort of an informed, uh, researched opinion. Yeah. 
that this is something that that, that I, I don't have the answer to. It. I I don't know where we are on it. I'd like to hear your opinions on it. But I do think that um, there's a huge difference between. Uh, I subscribe a lot to um, not subscribe, but I, I go a lot into books. I have a keen interest in books and publishing and uh, and. and I buy stuff on the Kindle all the time. And I actually stopped reading. You know, like when you buy a book of the Kindle, it says, read 27 reviews of this, you know. And I actually stopped reading the reviews on it, you know, because they're, they're unbalanced. They're not professionally put together. They're, they're just, they're, they're fairly wet, badly bad and rubbish, you know. And yet I will take the weekend's papers and I devour the book review to it. Now, is that because the book reviewer of the weekend paper is a professional, he thinks about it? Is that where I want to get my opinions? I don't know. I, I put down here that there's a huge difference between somebody giving their opinion of a movie or a book online and a proper professional criticism of a movie or a book. You might disagree with me on that, and, and I'm, I'm happy. If, 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 I, I wouldn't be displeased if you did. But I do think that, 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 that if you are a professional theatre critic, um, it's your duty to, to look at a play and to communicate how that play is structured, what, 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 how that play is put together, how the actors are performing their roles, and then to suggest to people, well, I think it's worth your while uh, give, give 25 quid to go into the show. I think it's very good because and, and the, when I talked earlier about the trust between the reader and the, um, and, the, and the writer, this is an element of trust because you say, well, particularly restaurant reviews, you know, like that you say, well, I go to that restaurant or I go to that play because a professional has written about it. And I was quite, I was quite overawed um, about two years ago when I went to London on behalf of um, the Belfast Telegram. And we, we, the Belfast Telegraph has a very, very successful website. And um, we went and it, it's a, also a huge advertising medium for all of Northern Ireland and gets an inordinate amount of ads. But we couldn't, as well, I couldn't understand how um, we weren't receiving, for the huge audience we had, why we weren't getting advertised. So we set, <coughs> so we set up a, a, a round of five meetings and London ad agencies for myself, the ad manager, and the number two in Belfast. And the, the objective was to talk to media buyers and say, you know, how does how do ads work on the online? How do you buy online? Why would you what would make you advertise in the Belfast Telegraph online? As it turned out, most of them didn't were unaware of the Belfast Telegraph online when they all knew it on in print. And the market penetration of online was far greater than um, print. But the one thing that came out to us was they were talking about a whole lot of websites that they advertise on. But they still go back to the integrity of the publishing, the publishing website. So they said, when we look at advertising on webs, websites, we would choose the Times, we would choose the Telegraph, we would choose the Daily Mail, we would choose any of the established publishers. And they, I said, well, would you advertise on Guido Fox in London, which has a huge political following. I, every government minister, everybody in politics in Westminster reads Guido Fox. And they said, no, because it doesn't have integrity. So it's good to remember that, that they are looking at the professional aspect of things. And what I'm not trying to do, and I hope it hasn't run, I'm not trying to, te I'm not trying to preach um, elitism. But you must accept, as I said at the start, that you are different than uh, a, a guy who sits down at a machine at night and said, was in the stag's head last night and the pint glare is horrible. You know, that's easy, right? You know, when you write something like that, people give it, carry the you know, you're right, you're right, the Irish independent or any side, it carries a far greater um, weight when you write it. Um, I, I actually put down, finally, or, uh, I actually put down a line, I don't know, maybe facetious, but, and it's, a, it's not an anti-line or anything like that, it's just to remind us 
that journalism is not a Facebook post. It's just not. I mean, you can say what you want to to your friends on Facebook. You can actually write a comment about, you can write an article about your favorite a weekend you spent riding the waves and slide or whatever. Journalism is not a Facebook post. And, and, and Facebook is not journalism. It's just not. I mean, and, and again, I'm not preaching elitism, but there are thousands of people out there I, um, who believe themselves to be journalists. And, and I was at a conference in London there recently where a girl stood up from the Huffington Post and she said, the nature of journalism is changing. Everybody is a journalist today. And they're not. She could say that forever, but they're not. And if you look at what organisations like the Huffington Post are doing, uh, there's one starting in Ireland where they're looking now for 40 regional, what do they call them? Regional news gatherers all around Ireland to contribute to a new website which will bring news from all around Ireland. And they're looking for news gatherers. And what they are, are they're looking for local people in little villages so they can help them set up a website and give them the gossip. That's not journalism. I, I worked on, many, many years ago, I worked on the provincial newspapers. And those who, who, of you who are from provincial newspaper territory know that there's the, the newspapers and then there's the local notes. And you don't put the same kind of importance on the local notes as you do on, the, on, on what appears in the paper. Because you know the local notes are written by non-professionals. Many times they're wrong. But some of the worst live actions in this country came from local notes. <coughs> and, and if you think, if you, if, if you think, kind of what they call citizen journalism, think local notes and newspapers because that's what it is. I mean, it has its place, but it is not journalism. And don't think <coughs> it is. And, and if you want to be, if you want to work at the profession of being a journalist, you know, treat it seriously. And, 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 and don't give it away, and don't be tempted to give it away by uh, listening to somebody who says, but that's easy, I can do that on Facebook, I can do that on, on, on Facebook. It's not easy, and, and to be done properly, it's not, it's not easy. So, um, I, I, I don't know how many of you, for a very short period of my life, I worked in Miami, and, and I worked for an organization, uh, called the National Enquirer. Does anybody know the National Enquirer? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, well, the, the National Enquirer at that stage was absolutely outrageous. And I think I worked in it for six, about four months. And the job I had to do was I had to go out to, from Lantana to West Palm Beach as a 22, 23 year old reporter. And I had to interview a woman who had been taken to the far side of Mars by aliens who landed at our swimming yes. pool um, that night. <laughs> and um, I had to make this work. Um, like I had, couldn't go into her and say to her, uh, you know, you're stupid, aliens don't exist. <laughs> because the preposition was, and like she could, you could see where they landed because all the, 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 the hedging around the, the swimming pool was, was burnt. That's, so that's where they landed, you know. And it's an amazing thing to do, to, 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 to make up a story without making it up. Now, it did, they had really, really serious uh, rewrite desks there. So it didn't make it through the rewrite desk. You know? and, and, and General Russell Pope was a wonderful one for now. He, 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 he built this vaccine up to 8 million. And it was incredulous. I mean, they were the guys who got Elvis Presley in the coffin when, when, when um, he died. And it sold 15 million that week. But General Otto Pope used to say, and I, I, I was fortunate enough to meet him once today, he used to say, um, in fact, if you ever come across a movie called Scandal Sheet with Burt Lancaster, it's not a particularly great movie, but it's a very good journalism movie because it is, it's the life of General Otto Pope. And if you understand what he does, and forget about the content, forget about the quality, it still works right across the board. General Pope used to say there are only two kinds of stories in the world. He'd say there's the G-quiz story 
and the Haymarket story. And the gee whiz story is that when you read, you're sitting in your living room in Middle America at night, and you read the National Enquirer, and you say, gee whiz, that's a very interesting story. And the Haymarket story is, uh, when you're reading the Enquirer, and you look at this story, and you jump out of your seat and run into the kitchen, and you say to your wife, hey, Martha, did you read the story of the Enquirer? So, I mean, that works for me. That works for the Kitty Holland story, it works for the Paul Wave story, and it works for the David White story. But <laughs> the one thing I just ask you to do, and I, I hope I'm not preaching to you, is that, is that there's, there's too much going around saying that newspapers are finished, that the websites are taken over. And if newspapers are finished, and magazines are finished, and Time magazine has gone online, uh, I make the conclusion then that journalism is finished. Journalism is not finished. Journalism will always be there. It will always exist. Because people will want to know information, and they will want information delivered to them in the proper, in the proper manner. Stick to your intellectual ground. Do things correctly. Don't don't cheapen. Don't cheapen what you should be doing because there's a whole maelstrom going around in the web. And, and I think one or two of you will be sitting here in another 30 years time telling people how we managed to ride the great transition from newsprint to to the web and to the other media. I hope I haven't bored you, but thank you very much for listening to me. Very good. <laughs> yes, um, Lisa. Um, hi, Michael. Um, I just had a question about um, like strength and balance between getting the story first and being accurate with the story. Um, like you said that journalism isn't changing, but that mediums are. And like every newspaper has their online platform now, so it's making them more competitive with each other as to who gets there first. And you gave the example of like having a few details about a story, like a woman going missing with her six-month-old baby. Yeah. Would you recommend breaking what details you have and then following up in a few hours yeah. when you have a more accurate picture? Yeah. Or what would you do? Would you get there first? Please don't replace speed for accuracy. Um, if you don't know the facts, don't put it in. And, and, and uh, yes, I would absolutely recommend when you're dealing with a... Uh, um, and when you're dealing with online stories, that, that, that yes, give, give what details you have. But also, give what details you don't have. Can you say, it is not known if the mother is a single mother, if it's not known the circumstances. And let people know what's not known, as, as it were. Funny, I, <laughs> I was at home, I live in Wigdell, and, and I was at home recently during the, there were power cuts and I really became terribly frustrated over it and uh, I picked and listened to RTE and I went online and I said well, tonight there would be power cuts for six hours, oh no sorry water shortages, uh, there would be water shortages uh, throughout Dublin, Kildare and parts of Wicklow and I said that's great man, uh, I just find out from part of Wicklow because I live in Wicklow. And I went off the RTA website, I went on <coughs> every single website I could find, including the local Wicklow everyday news, everything you want to know about Wicklow. They all said there would be one shortage in Dublin, uh, Dublin, Kildare, and parts of Wicklow. And I said, how does that work? And I know how it works. It works because the Dublin Corporation who supply Dublin, Wicklow, Dublin, parts of Wicklow, and Kildare. They put on their website there will be water shortages tonight between 6 and 10 in Dublin to their parts of Wicklow. And the journalists just went in like locusts into it and lifted it and banged it out. Without even thinking. Without even thinking that there is Wicklow, as you probably know from your geography, is West Wicklow, East Wicklow, with big mountain range, that there are thousands of people saying, How does that affect me? And you're not doing your job. You're getting paid to do the job and you're not doing it. Um, we briefly talked about um, how to get past VR people when you want to speak to the head of an organization, for example. What I often experience is then when I get past their PR spokesperson, 
um, they will say to me, oh, write your questions in an email, I will come back to you in a day or in two days. Yeah. I'm always very hesitant about that, and what is your opinion on that? It, 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 I'm not sure how it operates at the moment, but I, I do know that they say, well, just put that in an email and I'll come back to you. I'll come back to you. No. And I, I mean, I think you say, well, okay, I'll put it in an email, but I really don't want an email answer back. I want to discuss this with you. I don't understand what you said in your last email. Perhaps we'd be better off having a chat, have a chat, you know. And you probably lose as many at the start, more, far more than you win. But if you have the persistence to say, look, this is rubbish, I'm not accepting this anymore, you know. And, and, and then you can start, and then this is where authority comes, because you might have enough of the information to start kind of, start thinking about that. So is this how open government works? Is, is this the right thing? Is, is, is this right? Like, is this, they're controlling information, they're not letting me have information, they're screwing me up on uh, uh, FOI uh, requests. And, and, and you might have enough of the information, you certainly have to probably said the authority and the communication skills to write a common piece. And, and, and you could say, right, this is now the situation in, in, in the society. <clears throat> As a young journalist starting out, like obviously you said, you know, we'll all be trying to build contacts and build trust to create sources afterwards. One thing I found from interviewing politicians is that often they'll agree to go on the record and you'll talk to them and afterwards they'll be like, we send that article on to me now when you're finished so I can have a look at it first. Like, as a young journalist, my first thought was like, well, I'm under no obligation to send it to you. No. But then secondly, I was thinking, well, what now if they go off and start telling other people within where they work, do you know, don't go near her now because she'll... You know, she's an experienced if, if, if you live up to the benchmarks that you put down, are you quote him on the record? And you're not distorting him. I mean, if he wants to see the article before it's published, send him the article before it's published. Uh, but say to him, look, I'm not going to do that. This, uh, this is going in the, in the paper. I can't. Um, I, I'm not having any control over it. Like, yeah, it goes to the editors from now. And I can't guarantee that I'd be able to make any changes in it except for actual changes. And if he comes back and tells you he's 58 instead of 60, well, you have to change that. And but how then, long, huh? how long do you leave it until the dead? Would you leave it until the very day of the deadline to send it on? Like, or? I, I, I think that'd be churlish, you know. Like, okay. if if he got, if he wants to, see, I always remember what's going to happen. Like, if you're going to have a row with him and he wants to really screw you, mm. he's going to say to you, he's going to say, and furthermore. She didn't send me the article. I could have, I could have stopped all this. I could have prevented all of this row um, when she got this wrong, because but she didn't send the article to me in time. Okay. It's a difficult one. It's like it's one where you really have to use your own wits and your own yeah. um, thinking. You know. Sometimes. Okay, I think that's a good note to finish on. Michael, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.